Did you talk about the SAG after strike? It's over. The actors have finally ended their strike against the studios, which means Hollywood is open again. Everyone's got to work. Semi Poggy's moment, though I do think the actors got a worse deal than the writers, and neither of them got nearly the same deal as the UAW. So I don't know. They, they didn't get a ton of, like the studios had a much better negotiating position than the big three auto companies. Bob Iger stays winning. I'm not sure it's like a fucking major. I mean, they still got concessions. It, I mean, the fact that they striked was good because they got things they wouldn't have gotten. So big win. It's still a dub, but like they, they had to let go. Like they were really a stickler about getting a uh, percentage of streaming revenue. And the studio said no. And they said, okay, instead of 5%, give us 2%. The studio said no. All right, instead of 2%, give us 1%. The studio said no. And now it's like, they don't get any. <laughs> I don't know. They didn't They didn't get all this stuff. But they got some protections on AI. They got some stuff. It's like, it's like uh, it's still it's still good. But I do feel like from what I saw was that a lot of actors were getting pissed and really wanted to go back to work. So it, there wasn't like a unity. The Actors Guild was not all united in like, let's keep this going until we get what we want. It was like hey, this better fucking end or there's gonna be riots against our own guild. So, I don't know, I, it, it's progress, but I, I'm not gonna lie and say this is the greatest fucking deal of all time, it's not. My fiance is in SAG and honestly, she's just happy to work again. Yeah, that's the thing, it's like a lot of people were the same way. They were like, we can't wait any longer. People just had to work, which is like, which is fine, that makes sense, but also that's not really how you run a strike. Like if you're constantly letting it be public knowledge that like you are really desperate to work again, then the other side just has to wait a little longer. You understand? Like that's, that is just bad negotiating position. And like they were falling apart. I want your thoughts on this. Sylvester Stallone has like a documentary that he produced himself. <laughs> so it's obviously very positive on him uh, that came out on Netflix and it's been you know, top 10 or whatever. But just the thing, you know, like when you, you hover over on Netflix, it plays like a clip. It, he plays a clip where he's like, fuck, I wish I had it. Cause I think the way he delivers it is great. Do I have regrets? Hell yeah, I have regrets. Do I have regrets? Hell yeah, I have regrets. <laughs> but that also is what motivates me to overcome the regrets. You know, I look at like, if you're ever on a train in every window, this train <laughs> metaphor scenery is going by. It's like a photo, wham, wham, wham. And you're never coming that way again. And that's what your life is, Boom. snapping images, things whipping by, and you can't, it's gone. We saw that like 400 times because we kept scrolling through Netflix, and I thought it was interesting. I thought it was an interesting way to think about it. It's almost a little sad, right? It's kind of beautiful, but it's kind of sad, where it's just like, you know, there's all these moments I can think of, like, you know, I'm thinking about like that tiny office first year at Twitch. I'm, I'm thinking about like setting up the Twitch weekly show in the back with, but it's some of these people I never see anymore. I've never, I probably will never see them again, but it's just like, that's zoom, 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 zoom. And, and I have these little like a snapshot images of these one moment, but then it's gone. And it's like the next day, it never, it's interesting. It's just interesting. I, I, I think it's kind of beautiful, but it is kind of sad. But I don't think it's an aware moment. Everyone's so aware about things like that. If you've mentioned it, I just think it's interesting. And it makes you want to, I don't know, appreciate the good moments more. The feeling has been ever more present for me since becoming a dad. And yeah, it's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah, I don't know if it has to be heartbreaking, but it is, it is interesting how it's so fast, really, when you think about it. What if you get on the roundabout train? <laughs> okay, it's... I, <laughs> I've noticed this thing where anytime we use a metaphor to explain something, someone takes the metaphor too literally <laughs> and then goes too far with it. And then it no longer replies. You've stretched it past its capacity. And technically the roundabout train is someone that like does a life that's so similar that you're seeing the same shit over and over again, which is also a problem in itself. I mean, if you go to a cubicle for 40 years, that's the roundabout train. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And it's like, yeah, those memories are are pretty interesting snapshots. You you don't you don't lose them, but you almost see them too much. You got to put metaphors in Gen Alpha terms. Okay, it's like um, it's like imagine every episode of Skibbity Toilet could only be watched once. So you watch it and you see the cameraman fight and you see the Skibbity Toilet attack, but like once it's over, you can never rewatch it. Not even if you get someone else's iPad. Like you'll never be able to see it again. So you have to. It's like this moment in time. It was so beautiful but now it's gone, vroom, vroom, vroom. And so like at the end of it, when it's all over, you can patch together a sort of a story, but it's all based on fading memories from the past. It's like when you scroll through TikTok and you close it, and then you open it again and can't find a really funny meme. <laughs> it's not really like that. <laughs> it's not really like that, but <laughs> it's exactly like that.
All right, I see. It's like view once Snapchat. I guess, yeah, that's, I guess, what life is like. I want to know your peak rank in league because I no lifed it for a year and still have to, some toxicity in me. My peak rank in league was like 12, the 12th highest rank in North America because they used to have ELO instead of, you know, gold, silver, platinum or whatever. And you could see they would publish the top 100. I was NA12, which is a Korean 6,000 <laughs> at the time. This is like season two, three. NA12 is Korea 6 million. But I, I was literally right behind Skara. That's what I remember, right behind Skara. But that was when I that was when I literally no life did every single day. I would not let myself go to sleep unless I had 10 wins. I had this big Excel sheet. I would eat one Jimmy John's meal a day. I would skip all my classes. I did it for, I mean, it was a life ruining dedication. Do you think Scar remembers your fizz? No, but I do remember this. In season three, there was a CLG, Counter Logic Gaming, big team at the time. Probably don't even, Zoomers don't even know. They had a mid laner named Nientenso. Nientenso. And that guy had just got picked up for CLG. And I was ranked slightly above him on the ladder. And I remember thinking, why the fuck did they pick up that jackass? <laughs> no disrespect to the guy. I'm sure he's great. I just didn't know him. And I matched up with him. The day before World's Finals, the one that Faker won at uh, LA Staples Center. I was living in a shitty suburb of LA. I was commuting two hours to LCS games. Uh, it, was, it was shit, okay? Anyway, I remember thinking, I'm better than that guy. And I matched up with him. And it was my fizz against his twisted fate. And I went on, on God, 12 and 0. <laughs> I fucking crushed that guy in lane. And then I did, okay, but again, Fizz TF is a really good matchup for Fizz. It's not... I'm trying to reduce my toxicity. At the time, I was like, fuck you, yeah, bitch. But in hindsight, it was like one solo queue match where he wasn't trying that hard. Anyway, so I win, I crush him, and I dominate the game, and I get to carry, and it was fucking sick. And it's the day before season three Worlds. So I, next day, I commute to Staples Center, and I'm going to Worlds, and I see the whole CLG team in their jerseys, like going into the building. They're like taking photos with the fans outside. And I find the Intenso. <laughs> And I like ask for a picture. This is a true story, all right? And while I'm getting the picture, I'm talking to him and I'm like, hey, uh, you like that Fizz TF matchup? <laughs> and he's like, what? And I'm like, Fizz TF. <laughs> and he's like, what? What are you talking about? And I'm like, well, you know, I actually played with you in solo queue the other day, which again, when I think about this, it's actually so incredibly cringe. I want you to understand that I'm fully aware that I was a fucking troll. I was a I was a psycho troll. I was a bad person, all right? I didn't understand. And again, this is one solo queue game, but I'm like, you know, it's a good game. <laughs> and, he, and he could see when he figures out what's going on, he was kind of pissed. <laughs> he was like, yeah, hard matchup. <laughs> and, then, and then left. And I were thinking, yeah, I'm definitely getting on the team now. <laughs> I'm like, ah, he's definitely going to tell him about me. Like, that's... Anyway, it, this is all a learning process. And I honestly think about this sometimes because I get some really cringe DMs from people. Just once I've become a content creator, I get cringe DMs all the time. And some of them are like people that are well-meaning. They're even like, they're like supportive of me, but the DMs are so cringe. And I think about it and I'm like, yeah, all right. These guys are probably fucking the same age I was when I did that in the end. So like, you know, there, there's cringe in our lives and you have to fucking cringe to the cringe to... Oh, it makes sense. So, 